I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is the hotly anticipated part three of the Design Expert series and this week's guest is South African garden designer Leon Kluger who runs a design practice in Cape Town. This series has very kindly been sponsored by the London College of Garden Design, which is based in the UK at Kew Gardens, and they've recently launched the London College of Garden Design in Melbourne, based at the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria, so that may be of interest to Australian listeners. As Leon mentions in the episode, many budding South African garden designers train abroad, and I've had the pleasure of meeting some of them at LCGD, where they've been studying, and I've been bowled over by their creative use of plants that I could only dream of using in a design here in the UK. And Leon does go on to talk about the wide range of plants that he has available to him. I spoke to Leon about his work and the particular set of challenges he faces in South Africa. And let's just say, you might think twice that it's time you moan about aphids. I started out by asking Leon to explain the ethos behind his design business. On well, the landscapes that we install is um, it's it's a relaxed, very natural landscape where we try to incorporate you know, very interesting and unusual uh, flora from especially South Africa. You know, so uh, we're all about plants and. Um, preserving and promoting plants, especially South African plants. And on top of that, Western Cape plants, the Feinbos, which is so special in its um, entirety here, and it's only here. So we are very lucky to be able to be surrounded by this incredible kingdom of plants that we have here in the Cape. And that is our uh, prerogatives, actually, to promote it and grow it and um, also, when we do our gardens, it's not just taking the, you know, the common plants that's available to to the design. We also go on hikes and walks constantly and trying to find new plants and introduce new species into the landscape and horticultural world in this part of South Africa. That's interesting. So when you're going on a hike, if you see a plant that you like, how would you then introduce that into a garden? Do you do you kind of then s- try and source it or get it get it propagated? Yeah. So when we go on hikes and we see something that has potential, which is quite often, um, because we are very closely knit with Kirsten Bosch, and um, we I do the Chelsea Flower Show for them too. So we have you know, the resource over there to get some seed, to get cuttings, or to be able to go to an area where um, they do conservation and get permission to get some seed. And then we provide that to growers for us to grow. And, um, yeah, then they do that. Mm -hmm. And is it easier actually to do that than it is to source plants that are maybe non-native? No, non-native plants is much easier to source. To get native plants is the tricky part. You know, we have we have a lot of native plants that are easy to grow, and that's all available. But those are also available in the nurseries and garden centres in the UK. But it's those other ones that's a little bit more tricky, and those things um, have such great potential, and that's what we want to try and promote. So it's not just the, you know, the the, the plants that grow and you can sell them five times a year over and some of the other things too that um that we try to promote in in SA. Oh, it's almost a celebration isn't it of your native flora incorporating that in your design yeah definitely yeah so that's our main our main focus yeah is to promote our own flora and that's also why we do the international shows like chelsea and that's to take all of those very rare species and take them over there to showcase them there and we always get um, very interesting people that come and look at our stand at, in the Grand Marquis and um, inquire about those species and then contact the seed bank here in South Africa to get them to be grown abroad. We've done many um, shows, say for instance in Singapore, where we've taken seed over to be grown in Malaysia and it's now been adopted by nurseries to grow permanently there for for their market so which is quite nice so what sort of projects do you normally work on do they tend to be um, residential gardens or are they public spaces yeah so it's it's a mix 
it's an absolute mix. Um, so we do have, uh, being here in the Cape, we do a fair amount of uh, wine estates, um, private homes mainly, and public gardens, one or two, but not too many. I think our clientele are more the individual, and I quite like that. Each one with their own personality and their own quirks. And to me, that's more fun to work with. That's more challenging in a lot of ways to but a public mall or something like that's not 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 my my first love. Yeah, we don't have unfortunately in South Africa a lot of public parks. We've got Kirsten Bosch and some botanical gardens, but public parks per se in the cities we don't have much of that. Yeah, it's interesting to get a to- it's a totally different take um, on the whole garden design industry, really, um, which. It t- kind of takes me on to another question, which is um, if you wanted to train as a garden designer in South Africa, do you have many options mm. to do that? No, we don't. No, mm. not at all. So quite a few of the garden designers um, go abroad to train if they, if, if need be. But in the same um, breath of air, we don't have a lot of garden designers coming through the ranks. Um, it's, not a, it's not a profession that is highly popular. In SA, we have some very good designers here, but not a lot. And it's not a it's it's not a, a profession that is um, in the public eye. You know, <laughs> it's usually professions where the people drive the Mercs that that catches the eye. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and when when it comes to gardening, also, you know, you need to. Um, I strongly believe that the love for plants and gardening starts from a very young age. And it's usually a big influence from the parents or the grandparents as well. And if that doesn't happen, which I think in South Africa is more and more the case, because a lot of people grow up in apartments or in very densely populated areas where there's hardly any green spaces. So how do you learn that love for the green space? Yes, you go to a big open field or a lawn to go and play, but there's no individual contact with plants per se and to learn to understand plants. And in our education system in South Africa, plants definitely, even biology for that matter, is not very front up when it comes to um, you know education here. So in terms of gardens and horticulture as a whole in South Africa, is it is it a big thing? I mean, obviously in in Britain we are completely bonkers for it, but yes, is there, is there the jealous. same culture in South Africa? <laughs> <laughs> um, in in some parts, uh, I'm very lucky in Cape Town. Uh, uh, gardening is definitely uh, strong, but must also remember that um, gardening also has falls into priorities. And so most of South African population are not. Um, it doesn't have the spare change really to to maintain a green space around the house, or even or even buy the seeds for that matter. So it's a it's a tough um, a tough question um, to, to answer. So yes, I think a lot of people do adore gardens and do love flowers, uh, but when it comes to uh, the practicality of it, space and money, I think that's where the issue comes in. So if somebody had a gar- or, or had an outdoor space and not so much money to garden it, is that where people might be growing food, for example? Yes, most definitely. That space will be occupied by either, you say, um, um, corn or pumpkins or even chickens. So definitely, without a doubt. But... Saying that in the same breath, we had our first international flower show here in Johannesburg um, end of last year, and everybody loved it and came from far and about to come and look at the show and look at all aspects of gardening. So that was very, very heartwarming to see that there's still a very strong um, connection with, with greenery, although not a lot of people can can have that in their space no i mean we do have a a slight um, problem in the uk 
certainly in terms of training people, but also trying to get people interested in horticulture, particularly at the grassroots level of becoming, say, a maintenance gardener. Um, do you have that problem too? Yeah, we do, um, most definitely. It's um, it's in huge short supply, I would say. But what what I do, you know, appreciate from from countries like the UK is always is always a very strong from my point of view, a very strong um, projection of gardening from the RHS and trying to bring it into the public eye always, um, like for the Hampton Court show or the Chelsea show or all the other shows that they have. And that is something that we we are working on here in, in Africa. And that's the only way. It's the runway for gardening. You know, everybody, if you're very interested in clothes, whether you can afford it or not, you always look at the tabloids and see what's the new fashion out there or what's what's new trends, whether you like it or not, or it sparks an idea and maybe that um, brings you in, into future to go and study that. And that's the same with God. So when I grew up, um, I always used to look at the magazines and see what's new at Chelsea or Hampton Court or any of those shows. We didn't have any of that. And that's a big part of where my love for God came from. And that's from the UK. Talking about that, what trends are you noticing, um, it, whether they be sparked by the UK or they're just growing um, kind of grassroots up in South Africa? Um, yeah, I think I think a lot more focus on interest in plants here. And I think it's, it's in a lot of places. And it's not so much just the pretty flower. It's also about a lot of interesting plants putting nutrients back in soil, bringing the local wildlife into your space and plants that's not often used. Um, for instance, that um, a beautiful garden that was last year at Chelsea for, from Andy Sturgeon, that woodland garden of all the different textures of greens and interesting flowers might not have been roses or any of those bright in-your-face flowers, but still um, grabbed a lot of attention. And um, I think that's kind of where things go from here. But also in the same breath of um, air is that um, edible gardens, um, gardens that um, gives you a meditative um, feel. That's also definitely um, grabbing headlines here in South Africa. Yes, very much the same here. When you talk about the bringing the wildlife into the garden, are you seeing problems with native wildlife? Are they kind of dropping in numbers as they are over here? Uh, in, in certain areas, of course, but but I think there's a big drive in South Africa, uh, especially in my area where I came to bring wildlife to your garden. So most of the uh, the new areas or new malls are all planted with plants that only grown in the area, endemic to the West Coast or endemic to Tangle Mountain, more planted in the city. And that is definitely helping us with populations of birds. So I think the city of Cape Town, as much as they can, are doing a pretty good job at providing habitats for for the bird life. So I, I don't think we are... Um, um, <laughs> having a shortage of um we can always do more but i think um the public sector here in the cape is doing doing a pretty good job mm, well that's good to hear um so if do you think with the increased interest in plants that that hard landscaping is is kind of declining in popularity at all is that a trend yes maybe? definitely oh, okay yeah mm, which i'm glad <laughs> in a sense <laughs> because you know i'm I, yeah, you know, landscaping and, and it's also about plants, right? And um, yeah, promoting different kinds of plants. You know, plants can also provide a lot of architecture in a garden. It's not just the pergola. So I'm quite happy that there's more focus on on plants and on different species and what grows with you and what not, than just focus on the paving and the water feature. And we don't have water in the Western Cape. It's our biggest, biggest issue. About a year ago, we had nothing. So luckily, we had some rain. But Cape Town stood together. We really reduced our usage of water in the city tremendously. And we adapted our gardens mostly 
to 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 local endemic plants too, and taking out a lot of the water features around the city. We don't need those water features. In any case, treat it. So it's not great for any um, greenery in the water. So rather keep and maintain and um, our healthy ecosystems, all the little rivulets that come from Table Mountain going into the sea, rather spend that money on that and keep that clean and neat and tidy and get the birds to go to those areas in a fancy chlorine water feature. Yeah, so what other um, what other barriers are there to gardening in terms of climate? If uh, Obviously, water is one. Are you facing any other challenges? Yeah, water is a big one. Heat is, uh, yeah, we have certain times of the year where 40 degrees is nothing funny. Um, so that, I would, I would say, is, is the biggest. And then, uh, as I said in the beginning, is the availability of of variety of plants, that is a big one, you know, so but that's slowly but surely coming right. But but otherwise, you know, if you're in an area where we've got some antelope and bookies and giraffes and things, yes, that could be an issue. <laughs> that could be a challenge. <laughs> How do you keep a giraffe out of your garden? Oh, my goodness. If you can tell me, then I'll be the happiest <laughs> person. Yeah, so we, we do a lot of gardens in, in, in Kruger Park and Sabi Sands, all of those um, big parks. And and there's no fences in the camps. So what we do is it's not gardening per se. It's it's um, when they the refurbish um, the lodges, uh, which happens you know every few years, or they need to build a road, or something needs to happen. Then there's always a bit of destruction of the of the landscape. So we need to go and fix that to make it look like it's been never been touched. And as soon as you go and plant your goodies, which is hard to get because to find those endemic plants, you need to have specialist growers doing it for you. The elephants would come in the night and you <laughs> just see a crunch, crunch. <laughs> it's amazing how quiet an elephant can be, actually. Um, but but it's, oh, it's, it's quite nice. So it's very special to garden in a place where, you know, I always tell this, we're busy planting some water plants and, papyrus and things in the waterways in one of the camps and the one ranger put his um, hand on my shoulder and just said and right across from me it literally is like two and a half meters in front of me there's a leopard drinking water out of the same pond I didn't even see it <laughs> yeah so that is where gardening in South Africa and certain parts it's, it's, it's quite something something very special yeah so the next time we're moaning about slugs we need to think on really <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Don't, don't try, try, born, really. <laughs> yeah. Try chase the elephant with a stick out of the garden. It doesn't go that well. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting as well what you said about soil conservation. So is that another topic that's kind of very important to to you when you garden and, and in general? Yeah, of course it is. Um, um, for instance, here in the Western Cape. Um, <laughs> Good soil, um, nutrient-rich soil, is very, very scarce. And um, it's not something that you can find uh, on every property. It's mostly deep sand, you know, beach sand. And um, there's a big drive, especially from, from the city council also, that when developments happen, that those soil need to be preserved and then to be either distributed to, new, uh, to, to garden areas of the city council or to be retained and then used again at a later stage to top up. So uh, soil conservation, if that's the question that you were asking, you know, definitely very, very important, especially here with us in the Cape. So if you had, so you've got a finite amount of topsoil and then you need to just mm. protect that, obviously. But if you did find yeah. a, a garden it's like where... Gold. The, is it? Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so if you found a garden where there was just deep sand, is there anything you can do with that? Um, or do you need to import extra soil? It depends on what area is. So where I am on the West Coast, we have deep sand. So most areas have deep sand. Some of them have good soil that we keep and do preciously um, to one side. But if you have deep sand, we have great area which is called the Macquarie <laughs> and we have the most amazing plants and succulents that grow in this sandy sandy dune sand you know it seems like there's nothing that can grow in it but they do wonderfully 
Um, that's where a lot of the Arctotus and Gazanias and Lampranthus and Limoniums come from, which you guys also buy in six packs yeah. there in your nurseries. <laughs> and this we use for, for the dunes and all the sedges, chondropetulums, your, um, all those beautiful reeds that we've got here. So, no, we, we're very lucky that we have a massive, really big um, selection of plants that can grow in sand, sand, sand. So if you go to a region and you're looking at endemic plants, considering your region, for example, do you have a wide palette of plants that you can pick from that are endemic to that region? Yeah, well, no, we do. Definitely. It's just to find a grower to grow it for us. That's always the problem. So um, it also depends on which area. The Cape, we are we're getting there and we are having a lot of species being available, all the proteas and ericas and, like I said, all these succulents of the macrolan is fairly available. But if you go to the more um, northern areas where the Kruger Park, that, that is very, very hard to find and usually not attainable. So what we have to do is we have to harvest seed. We have to make cuttings of plants in the park and then have the park nursery grow it for us over a year's time. So there we are not, we are not up to scratch to getting the endemic plants. And a lot of them in the Kruger Park, if you've been there, it's it's not the, you know, they're pretty to me, but they're not pretty for a garden centre. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually lots of thorns, tiny little leaves, and, um, yeah, not uh, not a lot of flowers in all the parts of um, the Kruger Park that area. It's not famous for its flowers. So that's why most of them are not grown. Do you think going forward, if they get the correct exposure and publicity that people might warm to those type of plants yeah i think you know, as i mentioned it's it's happening it definitely is and that's the kind of plant that also saves you money in the long term because mm. that's not the one that's going to die when we have our it's, it was a 10-year drought and it seems like a two-year drought now and um and that that's the kind of plants that also attract the wild, local wildlife and that's what people like. So, no, most definitely there's an outcry for that instead of planting roses these days. Mm. Are roses popular? <laughs> they are. <laughs> in, in, always in the areas where they can't grow. <laughs> we always but, um, yeah. <laughs> no, no, they always will be popular. It's, it's a nice plant. They can't be grown in a lot of areas in South Africa, though. We are just we are just too hot. So we have uh, a few where they grow very well in Johannesburg and parts of Cape Town, but there is not really. No, and if if someone was going to have a garden with roses, I'm assuming they're going to need to be irrigated and and all the rest of it, kind of artificially propped up. Yeah. So the water water is an issue in the Cape. Um, the city council is very strict water so you can't you know all the water is monitored per meter and they will cut you off once you've got over your amount um so i think the roses are being used less and less but in Joburg it's still fine so people use that mm. so I, it's a bit sort of um backwards really i should have started with this question but um who inspires you who inspires you to garden in the way that you do or is it just something you kind of feel passionate about and you can't attribute it to a particular thing. Look, there are look there are designers that do um, that you kind of affiliate with. You see their passion. You kind of unite because you see yourself in them too. Um, like like James Basson, I think he's a brilliant designer, and I love his plants and his love for plants. And you can see with a designer whether they have a love for for plants per se. And um, and uh, and I, but I think most of the inspiration, yes, it does come from that, from shows and from designers too. But mostly is in the mountains, on the valleys where you walk, and that's why we do that constantly. Um, we try to go once a week to a mountain or a valley or or parts of a desert to go and see what grows, how does the textures work, what plants come together, what looks great. And I think that's where a lot of designers, I hope, also do that. We connect with nature to grassroots in the mountain and see how those things grow and what grows together. 
So if anybody wanted to visit South Africa or was planning to, um, mm. where do you think would be a particularly inspirational place to go? Ooh, we've got so many. I know, I know, and I'm wondering if you can think of any that are a little bit more be- off the beaten track. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, if you come to South Africa and you're a plant lover, well, you're in for a treat because this is a country which is about the most in, on earth. So uh, the Western Cape, you cannot leave out. So, But the Western Cape's divided in so many different sections. So I think the best time to come here would be around about July, August, and that's where the spring rains start, and that's when the Macaland's in flower. So the Macaland is the dry desert area. So that is where we have all the Macaland daisies and all your lots of pelagonians and gazanias and octotus and all the our annuals, and the most bulbs on earth grow there, and they're all in flower then, and that is a it's just something spectacular, which I never miss every year. It's just something you never get used to. Then there is Table Mountain and the Cape Peninsula, which is Cape Town. And that's famous. Proteas and eucospermums, which are pincushions and and oh, all your little ericas. And that's in flower kind of from then to a little bit later, which is also a spectacle to see. But if you don't have time during our winter time to be in Easter and you want to come in summer, and that's kind of now, then you go to the northern parts. So that is Dolstrom, Houting, Johannesburg, um, Hraskop, Blyder River Canyon. That is all your summer flowering stuff. And they're in flower now. And it's spectacular. I just saw photos today of Dolstrom, which is in Pumalanga on the east eastern parts. And it's one of the highest populations of um, terrestrial orchids on earth and they're all in flower now and it's it's just fields of orchids so we have lots to give you, <laughs> and you can go to the Karoo and the Karoo is just all these huge big like alien like succulents everywhere and that's also very special yes it sounds it well I will come one day hopefully um, will we be yeah. seeing you at any of the flower shows yeah, I, mean, I leave this week. We are going to the Shanghai one for this week. Then we're off to Chaumont and Saloire there in, in France. And then it's um, this, uh, which one is it then? Then it's Chelsea, I guess. <laughs> and then we're doing the Singapore Flower Show in July. Brilliant. Uh, so there's quite a few. Yeah, that is a lot. Um, and where can people follow your work if they wanted to? Well, they can follow follow me on, on Instagram, Leon Kluger, or, or Facebook. I think that's the two I keep up with. <laughs> yeah, you can't keep up yeah. with them all or you'd lose your sound. No, definitely. no, exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, but come and say hi to us in, in, in the UK at the Chelsea Flower Show in the Grand Marquis. This year is going to be a really nice, nice show of... of spectacular and very rare proteas and fainbos in that in our stand so i hope to see you guys there as leon says go find him at one of the shows if you're planning on going see the amazing plants from his corner of the world and hats off to cape town who from what leon says seems to be knocking spots off the uk when it comes to city planning for wildlife i'd like to say a very big thank you to leon for taking part thank you to the london college of garden design for sponsoring this series go check out their website lcgd.org.uk And thanks very much to you for listening. Catch you all next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All. Roots and All.